<clears throat> I don't know if you've had this experience. Anybody ever bought a car from a used car lot? He told me, and I didn't believe him, that he wasn't going to be happy unless I was happy. He was working hard to sell a car. And I knew in the back of my mind, because there's a certain markup with cars, that basically what he was saying was that he was willing to cut into a portion of his profit motive to still sell me a car that cost too much if he came down a little bit and made me a little more happy about what the price was. I don't know that that's him not being happy until I'm happy as much as it is a little bit of the necessary haggling that's involved with buying a car. There really wasn't a lot of happiness involved because I really just needed a vehicle and I wasn't happy about having to spend all of that money. But regardless, you have heard that phrase. I'm not happy unless you're happy. Or if you haven't heard that phrase, tell me if you've heard this one. If mama ain't happy... All God's people said, amen. Now, note to self, kids, husbands, if you heed those words and you learn to find your happiness and mama's happiness, life will be so much easier for you. Figure that out now. This morning, uh, that that theme of I'm not happy unless you're happy, I want to take it out of the context of uh, maybe like a swarmy used car salesman and put it in the context that when we talk about Christian joy, my joy is limited by your experience of joy. Like the, the capacity that I have for experiencing joy to th- this morning is to some degree moderated by David Jones's experience of joy or David Mills's experience. If David is not joyful in the Lord today. I can't experience all the joy that the Lord has for me or David Fickling or David Bear. We've got way too many Davids in this church. <laughs> the, the point is the, the used car salesman shtick that he puts out there uh, it is far more than a sales technique. It's a very deep truth that as Christians, our, the, the limit for our experience of joy is tied up corporately with the experience of joy that we all feel. Because the Bible says we're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we're supposed to weep with those who weep. And so this morning, as we have a chance to look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, we we see that Paul is is turning a page, uh, metaphorically, to talk about humble gospel living. We ended last week with Philippians 2, 1 through 11, which we we think is a hymn, a, a song, praising Christ for his humility to come from heaven to earth to be a man. And not just to be a man, but to be a servant. And as a servant, to be treated as a criminal who was obedient to his father even to the point of death. And not a natural death, not a sudden death, but death on a cross. And and Paul is so absolutely mind-blown by the humility of Christ He says, oh, dear Philippian believers, don't just look at Jesus' humility and marvel. Look at Jesus' act of humility as a model and learn how to be humble yourselves. So in in verses 12 through 18, he gives a treatise on how to live humbly, having just looked at Jesus' great example. And he's making a shift from Jesus' obedience to the Philippians' obedience. He's like, just as Jesus has obeyed, Philippians, let me encourage you in your obedience as well. So listen with me as I read Philippians 2, 12 through 18. God's word says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. 
even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. There are three quick things that Paul says in these uh, seven verses that are helpful for us to understand. And we begin with one of my favorite kind of enigmatic phrases in the New Testament. He begins in verses 12 and 13 by, by encouraging us to understand the mechanics of gospel working. How does the gospel work in our life? Well, he, he spells it out in verses 12 and 13 with, with something that sounds a little confusing. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out, that's the verb, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Well, he begins in verse 13 by commending these people that he loves very dearly. He calls them his beloved and says, guys, you have done a good job. You have always obeyed. Is there anyone that can say that about their kids? Nope. Always obeyed. But as beloved children, a church that Paul helped to plant, he says, guys, you, you guys have been exemplary. I am commending you, beloved. You have always obeyed. But then he uses their past obedience as motivation for their future obedience. He goes, as you've obeyed, not just in my presence, but even when I'm not around, do so even more. And this kind of reminds me of the first time we left the kids at home unattended. You remember when you did that? You know, they're, they're old enough maybe that they don't require a babysitter anymore. They're, they're teenagers and like we're just going to go to the supermarket for one item because we don't trust you to be at home any longer than that. We're just going to go get a block of cream cheese and we're going to be right back. And you come home and, and everything's in order and like no dishes have been broken. The dog hasn't done anything, eaten garbage and, or thrown up on your floor. And you're like, oh, this is so good. You did so good while we, were, while we were gone. This is not, you know, Paul patting them on the head. He is using this as a genuine commendation in a motivation. He's saying, you have obeyed, now press on. And what he's encouraging them to do is to learn from the example of Christ that we looked at last week. Jesus obeyed even to the point of death. You guys obey now especially in my absence. And so he gives this, this command, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <clears throat> now immediately, for those of us that are good Baptists, work out your own salvation sounds really strange. What he's not telling them is find a way to be saved on your own. What he's saying is he wants them to come into the full experience of all of the blessings and all of the enjoyments that come with being saved. Like, sometimes when you first become a Christian, like, you, 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 you don't have much progress on the pathway, and you look at where you've come from, and you're like, man, this is really hard. This is really hard. I have to learn to deny myself and to pick up my cross. Man, this is hard. Now, for those of you that have followed Christ for a long time, you've got a little more distance down the pathway. You can look back and you can see all of the ways that you've grown as a Christian, but if you're a brand new baby Christian, you don't, you don't see many, much growth. And so what he's saying is that the further you get, the more you have the opportunity to look back and see ways that God has been faithful, to see ways that God has shown up in your life, to maybe help you get through situations that you don't know that you would have been able to get through on your own. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So he's saying, when he's saying work it out, he's saying grow to a maturity that can look back and see all of, I want you to progressively and continuously experience all aspects and all the blessings of salvation. Because I guarantee you, whether you've walked with Jesus for seven minutes or 70 years, there are blessings that come from walking the pathway that Jesus wants you to walk. There's fruit, there's joy. And so he's not saying find a way to get saved by your own effort. He's saying mature into salvation and understand all of the blessings and the benefits that come. Now here's the thing that's, that's, that's challenging, okay? We talked about this last week. If, um, if we're giving out a humility award and if you're raising your hand going, pick me, pick me, you don't deserve it. Like that's just the way humility awards work. The minute you think you deserve a humility award, that is uh, exhibit A, 
that you don't deserve the humility award because you think you deserve the humility award. So here's the thing that's really hard. If we're supposed to obey in a humble manner, just like Jesus did, heaven to earth, to man, to condemned criminal, obedience to the point of death and even death on a cross. If we're supposed to have, if, if the goal in discipleship for us is humble obedience, how do you do that? You just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be humbly obedient. Does it take a lot of willpower? Do you got to, you know, you know, squeeze it out? How do I get to be obedient? I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to do my exercises. I'm going to, you know, do. There's no way, humanly speaking, that you can work up humble obedience. It just doesn't work that way. And yet what Paul says about gospel working in verses 12 and 13 is so awesome. God, God wants you to work out your salvation. He wants you to work out. Verse 13 says, it is God who works in you. God works in. You work out. But the work that you do is dependent on God working in you. It's, it's a bit of a mystery. God works in, you work out, but your work is only possible and depends completely on his work. Meaning, if you're doing work, but God has not done work, your work doesn't count. It's dead works. God works in what you work out, and that's a beautiful mystery. Now, this is for some of you who say, this sounds a little hard. You're telling me as a human being, I can't work out anything except what God has worked in. Absolutely. 100%. You have heard that right. And let me, let me encourage you that it's not so hard for you to understand because there's another Bible verse that talks about something that God does that we respond to. The Bible says that we love Him because, what's it say? He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. If he didn't first love us, what kind of capacity would we have for loving him? Zero. We love him because he first loved us. We work out what God has worked into us. And so when it comes to maturity in the Christian life, like progressing as a disciple, God has already given you everything that you need. You just have to work it out. You just have to avail yourself of the resources that he has already given to you. Now, there's, a, um, there's a, another passage that talks a little bit about this that I think is really interesting. If you go, if you, you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, you see this, this similar equivocation that we can only work out what God works in. And the way this equivocation is demonstrated in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 is it talks about works in two different ways. It talks about works that are dead works, and it talks about works that are godly works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says it like this. <clears throat> oh, it starts on the other page. Excuse me. My pages are sticking. There it is. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, listen, not a result of works so that no one may boast. This isn't something you did. You can't brag about it. Verse 10 goes on. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Your works are not about your works. Your works are about God's works. And He has prepared them beforehand. So God works in you, you work it out, but your work is only possible and depends upon His work. The truth is, we, we like to think that human freedom is completely unlimited. But I hate to tell you this, and I hate to burst your bubble. You are not as free as you think you are, okay? Now, my, uh, my son would love to think that he could wake up this morning and decide to be six foot two and run a 4 four forty. Does it work that way? Absolutely not. You may like to think that you can wake up this morning and, and, and know everything that you want to know about quantum physics. Does it happen that way? Or uh, where's summer? Organic chemistry, you know? Whatever it is that is, you know, your cross to bear. You don't just get to choose to wake up one morning and be taller or to be smarter or to be stronger or to be faster because our freedom is limited. We can't just do anything that we want to do. And if you live in that fantasy land, be prepared for massive disappointment 
because um, if you're from my genetic stock, you're not going to be six foot two. You're definitely not going to run a four four forty. There's limitations, and so the best way that I've heard this explained, when we talk about the fall of humanity and, and what's happened to limit um, our freedom or our sovereignty, is you can think of I'll, I'll use the stage here. Think of a giant muddy pit, giant muddy pit. It's it's bigger than this. It's the size of this whole room, and it's super steep. Uh, you're not going to die if you fall in it, but let's say it's 20 feet deep. Once you start falling, you're not going to be able to stop yourself. And we have the freedom while we're outside of the pit to walk around the pit or to go away from the pit, you know, go to Disneyland, go wherever you want to go. But the minute you choose to slide into the pit, you lose all your freedom to be out of the pit. You can try as hard as you want to to crawl your way out of that pit. It's not going to happen. So you can sit at the bottom of the pit. You can have a cookout at the bottom of the pit. You can, you can jog around the bottom of the pit if you want to get in shape. But you do not have the freedom once you're in the pit to get out of the pit. That's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. Friends, we are all at the bottom of the pit and we're doing different things. But we do not have the freedom by ourselves to get out of the pit. We have lost that freedom. Human freedom is limited. That's why when we say, our work, it's important. Paul gives the command, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But recognize that your work is only possible because of something that God is doing in you. If there's not that spiritual energy to empower what you're doing, it is dead human works and it is no good before God. And yet we live in, we live in a day and an age where we don't have the ability to see people's hearts. And we just think this outward activity that we see makes people godly. What is it that makes people godly? It's not what you do on the outside. It's what God has done on the inside to regenerate you, to give you life. It's your faith in Christ, Christ that makes you godly. Not helping little old ladies cross the street, as good as that is. Not getting a perfect attendance pin for attendance Sunday school, as good as that is. Not memorizing books of the Bible, as good as that is. It's a godliness that emerges from the heart and overflows into what you do. This clears up a misconception that I think is really prevalent. There are some people that think that Christianity is all about rules. It's about rules. And the way I heard it, I've said it before, the way I heard it when I was a kid is I don't smoke or drink or cuss or chew or run around with girls who do. That's what you wanted to do if you were a good Christian. You, you were really careful about doing good things and not doing bad things. Christianity is not about a bunch of rules. It's about a transformed mind and a transformed heart that wants to live gospelly. I think I just made that word up. You want, do you want to live gospelly? Do you want to live in a way that's consistent with the gospel, that's in step with the gospel? It's not about rules. Get your emphasis off of rules. It is about a mind and a heart that has been transformed and wants to live for the gospel. And we do things, we work things out. It's been said that where there is a submissive mind, there will always be service and sacrifice. If you have a mind that is submissive, you're going to find ways to serve Christ through his church. You're going to find ways to sacrifice for Christ's church. This was true of Christ. It's true of Paul. We'll see in just a, a, the next chapter. It's true of Timothy. It's true of Epaphroditus. But God says it's not just willing or wishing. It's actually doing the work. It says that it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. It's not just about willing or wishing for better things, but actually doing and working. And I love the way that verse 13 puts the command of verse 12 into theological perspective. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. So he talks firstly about understanding the mechanics of gospel working. It is not all about you. It's about God and the work that he is doing. But his second command that we see in verses 14 through 16 is he wants us to hear the command to submit and to shine. Hear the command to submit and shine. Verses 14 through 16 say it this way, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be found I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We're commanded to work it out in verse 12, but then the question is how? Here's the thing that's amazing. You know how, Jesus, uh, how Paul answers the question, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Here's how. Um, don't 
grumble or complain. Work out your salvation. Don't grumble and complain. Everything that he says about grumbling and complaining is communal. It's not personal. It's us. How do, what's the relationship dynamic? It's communal, it's relational, it's social, and it's summed up with no grumbling or complaining. Now, what is, what is complaining? Grumbling, we know what grumbling is. I don't like it. Grumbling is an internal conversation that finally works itself out into... If, if, if grumbling is internal, complaining is external. So here's the bad news. If you complain, you've sinned twice. Because you've already had the conversation with yourself, and now you're going to have it with somebody else. So you've sinned against yourself, now you've sinned against a brother or sister by your complaint. That word for uh, disputing comes from dialogos. You're having a conversation with yourself. And note to self, when you are having that conversation, sometimes you need to talk back to yourself and tell yourself to shut up. Zip it. Close it up. Because if you don't, that inner dialogue that you have that's not good is going to find its way out, and now it's not just a problem for you, you've made it a problem for someone else. This recalls, this grumbling and complaining, recalls the testimony of the wilderness generation that God said of those uh, people who were rescued from Egypt that all they did for 40 years in the wilderness was what? Grumble and complain. Is that, is that the group of people you want to be identified with? A bunch of grumblers and complainers? <clears throat> grumbling and complaining. You sit there and you go, this is how Paul tells us to work out our salvation? Stop grumbling and complaining? We, we tend to think of grumbling and complaining as like very unserious, like minor sins. And yet they're very serious because they breed a disunity that blurs the effect of the gospel. If you are known as a grumbler or a complainer, there's one thing that's true of you that you don't even realize. It's impossible for you to have joy while you grumble and complain. And so when you grumble and complain, as, as insignificant and as non-serious as you think it is, you are confessing in some way that God is not sufficient to meet your needs because your circumstances are not what you want them to be, as if you're sovereign. You're not. So when you grumble or complain, you blur the effect of the gospel. And I love this because you see Paul's, and I'll say God's, great desire for the believers in, uh, at Philippi. He says he wants them to be blameless. He wants them to be innocent. He wants them to be without blemish. And you want to know, know the first step on the road to blameless innocence without blemish? Stop grumbling and complaining. Stop grumbling and complaining. That, that feels, that feels kind of heavy. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to you. I'm saying that to myself. But you also have to recognize, like, do you have a pre, does anybody here have a predisposition to grumbling and complaining? This is, this is not the same temptation for everybody, okay? So, like, if you're giving the elbow to the person sitting next to you, praise God that maybe that's not your besetting sin. There are some people that will have to work harder at this. Because maybe you've given into it as a habit. Or maybe you're just a more pessimistic personality. That you just live with a mild level of discontentedness all the time. You know, everything can go your way. And you're like, well, how is today? So-so. Everything went your way. What do you mean so-so? Some people have to work at this a little bit harder. And yet, it's so hard for us not to grumble and complain. Because the context in which we do this is a dark world with crooked how did it say it? Crooked and twisted people. It says it's a crooked and twisted generation. That word for twisted in Greek is scolios. It's where we get the word scoliosis. Your spine is twisted. It's not straight the way that it's supposed to be. And he's saying, Paul's saying, I, I want you to work out your salvation by not grumbling and complaining, despite the fact that we live in a world of twisted and wicked people, crooked people, who elevate selfish ambition and self-interest. You cannot be like that. Because when you complain, you're saying your interests are more important than their interests. Or your interests are more important than our interests. But yet, this is the environment that we're called to shine. He says, you're going to shine like lights in the, in the midst of a, a dark world. You're going to... Uh, shine like the stars in the sky in the middle of the night. And he says the way that we shine 
I love this, is by holding on to the word of life. He says in verse uh, 15, uh, I want you to be innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How do we shine? By holding fast to the word of life. Why does he want us to hold fast to the word of life? He wants us to prove that we really are the children of God. And when we grumble and complain, we turn the lights off. One of the things that's fun about being a dad is you get to decorate your kids' rooms. Now, some of that has gotten a little bit out of hand. You watch social media and people have crazy, crazy rooms. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, that's, that's way too much. But a cheap, a cheap thrill when your kids are really young is to buy those glow-in-the-dark stars. And you put them on the ceiling. And your kids don't know it because when the lights are on, you can't even really tell because they're, they're like the same color as the ceiling. But the minute you turn the lights off, what happens? You have this strange little neon green glow all across the ceiling. And the Bible seems to indicate that the darker it is, the brighter we shine. And yet that room with a hundred stars in it shining, when you grumble or complain, you start, pulling the, you start pulling the stars off the ceiling. And the room begins, maybe imperceptibly at first, to get darker and darker because there's less light and less light. And when you grumble and complain... You turn the lights out. Our relationships as Christians should give life. The reason we don't grumble and complain is because we submit to the word and we want to give life. Not just once when we die, but now in how we live. We want to be life givers. And if we hold on to the word of life, our relationships should be life, not death. And yet how many of you have relationships with brothers and sisters that are more death than they are life? They crossed you once. Never again. You're dead to me. Our relationship should be life, not death. And there's a lot at stake. Paul says, if you don't hold fast to the word of life, if you don't try to stop grumbling and complaining, Paul says, you're going to make my work completely in vain. You're going to make it in vain. And you're going to compromise our Christian witness because our corporate behavior, especially our attitudes towards one another, go a long way to determining how effectively We can hold the word of life out to other people. If people see life in our relationships, they want a part of that. If people see death in our relationships, then we look no different than the world. And why in the world would they want what we're selling? Our relationships that we have with believers can hurt evangelism. But if we hold fast, if the Philippians hold fast, then Paul says he can be proud of God's work both in and through both of them, through Paul and through the Philippians. Submit and shine. In verses 17 through 18, as we wrap up, Paul says we need to learn to rejoice in sacrifice. <clears throat> we need to learn to rejoice in sacrifice. Verses 17 and 18 say this. He says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. You don't see this in your English translation, but the word for glad is joy, and the word for rejoice is joy. So four times in two verses, Paul says, if I'm being poured out, I, I have joy and I'm re, I am rejoying with you. And likewise, you should have joy and you should rejoice with me. Four times, two verses, joy. And yet there are two sacrifices that we actually see in this passage. Paul says he's being poured out as a drink offering. How is that happening? He's being poured out upon the sacrificial offering of the Philippians' faith. The Philippians have made a sacrifice by raising their hand and saying, we're believers, we don't worship Caesar, we worship Jesus. And and they demonstrated their faith in Christ by their gifts to Paul's ministry. So that is the sacrifice, that's the meal offering. That's the animal laid upon the altar that is getting burnt up. So Paul's using an Old Testament analogy. He's saying he is the drink offering that is poured on top of it so that the, 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 the wine or the fragrant oil that it was that's being poured out immediately converts to steam and makes this cloud and it's poured out on the burnt offering on the altar. And Paul's saying, I am, I, if I am being poured out, if this is the end for me, if I'm not going to escape from prison, if this is the end of life and I'm going to be a martyr, I'm okay with that. I have joy and I ask you to re- rejoice with me. So Paul's referring to their persecution and support of Paul. And Paul's referring to his suffering and his imprisonment. And he says, regardless of his circumstance, even potential martyrdom, he has joy. He's learned to rejoice 
in the sacrifice. Now, here's the thing that's really cool. <clears throat> is he ends up what he has to say in verses 17 and 18. Every reference to the word joy so far in the book of Philippians has been a reference to Paul's joy. And Paul has it in spades. Joy, 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 joy. Everywhere. Joy. To this point, it's all been about Paul's joy. Verse 18, he makes a subtle shift from his joy to their joy. Or I'll say, your joy. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. What Paul is doing is he's making it clear that joy is essential to the Christian life, and it is regardless of your circumstance. Paul's in prison. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And yet, despite his circumstances, he has joy. Every parent knows this. Like when you become a parent, there's a pretty significant loss of freedom that you experience because you're now responsible for another life. And yet, when you see them take their first step or you see them catch their first fly ball in the outfield without smashing their face or you see them go on that first date or get their driver's license or cross uh, and get their, across the stage and get their high school diploma or um, their first serious heartbreak or their first serious relationship and the wedding and the grandkids, at every point where you see someone else's progress, you don't mind the sacrifice because you see what it's all about. You rejoice in the success of others. And Paul's saying, hey, if, if you hold on to the word of life and you don't grumble and complain and you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Paul can say, I, could, I can go to the cross myself. I can get beheaded. It can be the end for me. And I will know I have not run in vain because I see fruit through God in you. And I'm okay with that. Regardless of what the circumstance is, there's a loss of freedom that Paul's now experiencing, but he can rejoice in the success of the Philippians. Moreover, I think the thing that Paul is trying to say is that our joys are tied together. Paul's joy is limited by the joy of the Philippians and vice versa. And to say, what if our church became a place where when you walked out of here, there was no doubt you walked out with your joy cup filled up that our love for each other and our care for each other in our affliction was so significant that we walked out different than we came in. Anybody walk in here this morning knowing that you needed to be here, but maybe not really excited at the prospect? It's been a hard week. There have been some difficult things that you've dealt with. Or, you know, you're wondering whether this Christianity stuff is really true in the first place. That person is sitting here to see if we're serious enough about the joy that we're preaching about, to see if it's really true. Because they're living their life from happiness to happiness according to the world standard, and it does not satisfy. They're some of the most miserable people in the world because they're looking for joy in every wrong place. And they're coming to church, maybe against their will, and wondering, do these people have any more joy than I do? And I would say, you are blaspheming God if you don't demonstrate it. God, is a, God has come that we might have life and have it what? More full. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So here's what's happened. Paul has modeled joy in the midst of opposition and suffering. He's concerned in chapter 1, verse 25, he's concerned for the Philippians' progress and he's concerned for their joy in the uh, latter half of, of Philippians, he's sending reinforcements to the Philippian church in the person of Timothy and Epaphroditus who will increase their joy. Chapter 2, verse 28. They're going to come and you're going to have even more joy. And he's about to hit them with an imperative, with a command. In chapter 3, verse 1. In chapter 4, verse 4, in which he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. He's trying to get them ready for that. Because that's a body blow if there ever was one. Rejoice in the Lord always. Not when you want to, not when it's convenient, not when you're happy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he has to demonstrate joy in the Lord himself. And he hopes to pass it on to the Philippians that, so that when he says the words, rejoice in the Lord always, they're like, well, yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. So this morning... I ask the question in conclusion, is this kind of living really even possible? 
Some of you are naturally a little more cynical, right? Um, some of us are optimists. Some of us are pessimists. Some of us are just a little more cynical. And so for the cynic here, I, I want to legitimately ask the question, is this kind of living really even possible? Why would we ask that question? Well, the easy answer is because life is hard. Anybody experience any of life's hardship in, uh, say, the last 10 years? Anybody experience hardship? I'm not the only one. Life is hard. You know what Paul says? Yup, I'm in prison. He's already said it's a dark, twisted, and crooked world. He acknowledges the hardship of life, but he says that is not enough to stop your joy from shining through. Is this kind of life really possible? You might say, I have tried really hard. I've tried to be joyful. That doesn't sound very joyful the way you say it, but like, you know, you sound kind of aggravated that you've tried to have joy and you haven't had it. But you go, I've tried so hard. Here's the question for you. Is it your effort or is it God's? Remember, God works, you work, but your work is only possible and is dependent upon his work. Maybe you have tried to have joy in your own strength. Can I just encourage you by saying that's the wrong way to go about it? There, there is a way in which you allow the Spirit of God to work in you that brings you joy. You don't manufacture it yourself. I remember trying to learn how to water ski. I don't know if anybody's been water skiing. But you can listen to people who know how to water ski, or you can be like me and just say, I'll learn on my own, which means I practically drowned myself. You know, I don't want to listen to anybody. I want to learn on my own. Now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to muscle it. You know, I'm strong enough. I can do this. No, I couldn't. Like, what I needed to learn was to actually let the water do the work. You know, it, it provides the friction. I just learned how to cruise on top of the water. And when I finally learned how to water ski, it was so easy. But when I was first learning, I was so stubborn to try to muscle it myself, I couldn't do it. And in the same sense, if you are trying by yourself and failing, you need to understand that there is something for you if you let the Spirit do the work. You can water ski through life by the Spirit. Paul provides his own best period at the end of the sentence. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he summarizes the secret to how he lives with joy in his life regardless of his circumstance. And this is what he says, and this is my prayer for you, because the gospel's in it. Letting Jesus do it and not you yourself. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, you don't just need the gospel to get saved. You need the gospel to have joy. Because God didn't save you by His grace that you can live by your works. But work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you both to will and to work. Would you pray with me, please?